gardening is all about trial and error. Sorry for the pun, but it's true. It's through mistakes and failures that we pave our way to success. So here are my five biggest gardening mistakes that we can learn from. We may have grandiose dreams of bountiful gardens in our heads, but nature has a way of derailing our plans. We all go through this. The more experience you have, the more failures you have gone through. So here's my first mistake. It's lack of planning. I like to grow in a rather intuitive way, but if you want to have successful harvests, then you have to plan, especially for late summer and fall. As you can see here, I have an open bed, which I was hoping to have successful crops. Perhaps I could be starting lettuce or other greens that love the fall. I should have started things earlier inside, and that way I would have plantlets ready to be put in right when the space opened up. It's just that as we get into the hot days of summer, as mosquitoes invade the garden, water is a little bit more scarce, or there's too much water and it's raining all the time, we get a little bit lazy. And we forget that if we want more things to, to continue producing, we have to plan accordingly. So plan for your crops, don't plant everything at once, and always have a few extra seedlings growing if you want a continuous harvest. The clearest sign of a master gardener is the ability to know when to step back and when to intervene. Mistake number two is to not take pests seriously, especially the persistent ones. I do have a little bit of a laissez-faire approach when it comes to gardening and pests. I like to first observe where things are and take little action. But there are some persistent pests like harlequin bugs with Christopher's vegetables, such as this broccolini here, that they just will decimate the crop. It's weird because their population explodes and then suddenly they don't have the plant that they just killed to feed off of. So it's not sustainable for them. In any case, I should not have taken a hands-off approach and let them be because unlike some other pests like aphids and even cabbage worms sometimes, they are taken off by predatory insects. But in my experience, these little beetles cannot be exterminated by just letting nature do its thing. They destroy everything, they reproduce fast, and I'm wondering here if I haven't just invited a huge problem into my garden. I have some collards growing on the other side that I've been more vigilant with taking away the pests and they are doing okay. There's a lot of damage to the leaves, but they'll be fine, I think, and come winter, the population of these beetles here, the harlequin bugs, will die down. But I know that if I let them reproduce, they might increase in numbers in my garden. That's never a good thing. So keep vigilant when it comes to certain bugs, don't let them spread. My main flaw as a gardener is to let things just grow wild. Tell me in the comments what is your biggest gardening mistake. I'm curious. The third common gardening mistake is being too soft on plants. Sometimes as a gardener you have to be ruthless. And this is one of my biggest weaknesses. I just can't take out volunteers. It always pains me a little bit because volunteer plants just grow so well. They want to grow and they decided to grow there and pretty soon you have a sea of cherry tomatoes everywhere taking over all the other things you grew. It usually happens by the end of the season closer to October when it just takes over the garden and the garden becomes something that you cannot traverse. It's a sea of plants full of mosquitoes because mosquitoes love to congregate around plants and tomatoes are especially good at that. So even though volunteers can be amazing and sometimes they can actually be rather tasty, still they take over everything. So be ruthless, take plants that shouldn't be there 
and allow the plants that you have intentions to grow. But I'll say sometimes do leave a volunteer here and there, just so you learn. Learning is by default an act of observation followed by deliberate action. Do you naturally like to observe or intervene? The fourth common mistake is actually a contradiction of the last one. But that's okay because life is always full of paradoxes. The mistake is that you neglect native species that just pop up. These are black-eyed Susan. They're native flowers. They're actually the state flower for Maryland. These just grew here. They're amazing. And even though the groundhog has been eating some of the leaves here, they appear to be healthy enough and they do last a long time. These are perfect plants. And there are some other weeds that are growing around the garden, like mulling, which I personally love, and I'm just allowing them to grow there because they're gonna do the work for me. And if nature wants to do the work for me, I'm more than happy to just take the ride and relax. When you use native species, they're gonna be less stressed with the climate. If there's less water, they're more adapted to the local place. And pests aren't as keen on completely destroying them because they're used to the pests. So there's a bit of a balanced relationship already happening and that's why they're native species. If you allow them to happen where they need to happen, you will have a more lush and local garden. There is a bit of a half mistake and half tip in this forced mistake. That is to not know the seedling when you look at it. You have to learn somewhat generally what typical seedlings of things you want growing look like. And as you start to become more accustomed to them, you will allow the things that are desirable to stay and you're going to remove the things that are going to be excessive or even invasive. As you learn this, your garden will grow more prosperous and your life is going to be easier as you have to fight less nature. And that's always a good thing. There is another very important aspect to allowing native plants to grow in your garden spontaneously. They will start to attract wildlife, especially the pollinators. Native bees rely on wildflowers in order to be able to sustain themselves and they also happen to be great at pollinating your plants. So it's a win-win for the bees and for yourself. For the fifth and final mistake, I'm gonna ask my friend Greg from the YouTube channel some room to grow to share what was his biggest mistake gardening. Hey Silui, thank you so much for having me on your channel. So my biggest mistake is when we built these beds last year, I did not do a very good job of mixing up a good ratio of ingredients to provide a healthy growing environment for our veggies. And furthermore, after we had a, a disappointing season last year, I didn't take the time and effort to investigate what happened there so that we could fix it. I just threw some compost on the top of everything and hoped for the best over the winter. And surprise, surprise, we didn't have a very good harvest this year either. And so I finally had a soil test done just recently and learned a lot from that. So right now I'm gathering all the information that I can to put in an upcoming video with much more detail about what's going on here. So if you'd like to learn more about that, please check back on my channel in the future. I wanna make sure I have all the best information for that. Uh, for right now, I can tell you that with this soil, the pH is much too high at 7.5, it's too alkaline. Most of these things prefer the pH to be down at about 6.5 to 7 in order to be able to take up the nutrients that they need because I know that there are a lot of nutrients in this soil the plants are just having trouble taking those up because it's not the right pH level so my advice is to learn all you can about your soil test out the soil texture rub it between your fingers look closely at it do different experiments, growing different things in it, and take samples and send those to a lab. There are a lot of free labs around the country and some that you can pay a little bit for and learn a lot. And just really get to know exactly 
what is going on within it and make sure to keep checking on it from year to year because it will change as you grow different things that take up different nutrients from the soil you will need to make some adjustments and uh, adding compost is usually a really kind of catch-all way to to keep it healthy but it's really important to stay focused on that and make sure that it stays healthy and that's the best way to have nice healthy veggies. Otherwise, uh, if you let it go, you'll wind up with another disappointment that could have been avoided. Thanks, Greg, for sharing the experience with us. I know that gardening at times can seem a little bit discouraging, but it's exactly by learning through our mistakes that we learn to be better gardeners. If you want to find out what was my biggest mistake, then you're going to have to head out to his channel and check out the video. See you there.